column and, and the so the total degrees of freedom will be 13 and just fill in the yellow using that I'll be filling the, the blanks using that I think it'll I think it'll work that way yeah so, uh, so anyway here we are 2f and 3f and 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 so the the objective is it's going to allow you to efficiently investigate a bunch of factors with some you know with without having to go overboard with your number of experiments so so because if, if you only got two levels and you know Five, five variables, well, okay, then, then we're, we're not that bad. Two to the fifth is a lot better than four to the fifth or something like that. And, and you, you can mix and match, too. You don't have to have all two level on everything. You could have two levels on some, three on the others. There's, there's no reason that's, that can't happen either. So if you've got one particular factor that's annoying you and you want to get more granularity than just high-low. So, uh, and so it's going to allow us to call out maybe unimportant factors or eliminate some of the dimensions that, that we don't, aren't important. Factor B is not, not important. Okay, let's get rid of it then and for our more detailed experiments. So the two factor has low and high. And the three factor has a low and a middle and a high. And so uh, it makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense why they would name it that. And so uh, one of the assumptions in this particular chapter is that we've got uh, complete randomization in our treatments. We can sign them any, you know, our, our subjects to anywhere, anytime. We have no background variables, there's no blocking variables, nothing's interfering with us, we're getting all the experiments done in the same amount of time or, you know, under the same manufacturing conditions. So that's not a problem until chapter eight. So the things you, you'll want to take away from this is that, well, obviously 2F is more efficient than 3F. Well, yeah, because you know, it's got low and high instead of low and mid and high. That's a, that's a kind of a, a, a no-brainer. You can mix or match, two on some, three on the others. That's fine, there's, there's no restriction. You don't have to have all twos or all threes. Like, you know, remember the Latin square had that goofy restriction on it. Uh, 3F will let you pick out quadratic. Makes sense, right? I mean, if we've only got high and low, <laughs> the best we're going to get is a linear function in there. And, and three, the 3F will let you pick, a, you know, see a quadratic behavior, which is nice, because you might be interested in is there a quadratic behavior more so than just uh, linear. Uh, and then this notation, the notation in the high-low, this concept of, of uh, con contrast, and some of that will show up in some, in, some, in some of the later chapters, so it's worthwhile to, to pay attention to it. So that's, that's our little introduction. So now, what, one of the things in the chapter, uh, they start out with example 7-1, and they want you to look and just kept, uh, start coming up with the, uh, evaluating the degrees of freedom, and I think, I think they're introducing things just to get you thinking um, uh, you know, broadly in this 2F subject. So they say, hey, We've got a five factors and two levels, and we want to assess the main effects and the first order interaction. So, so one of the reasons I like it, you know, examples like this too, it lets you think again, what's the main effects, what's the first order interaction, kind of clear that up. And so um, we're going to have two levels, so it's a 2F. So in this case, this would be a 2-5. F is five since there's five factors and two levels each. So we've got, uh, so first I'm going to plop the answer out like they did, and then let's, let's figure out how we get the answer. So, so there's five main effects. So, uh, and each of them have one degree of freedom, right? Because it's low and high. And remember, if we got a an average, then, then then we only got one thing that could vary. So there's one degree of freedom there. There's uh, ten first order interactions, each having a degree of freedom. And then there's a bunch of other higher order actions, sixteen of them, each with a degree of freedom. So there's there's thirty one degrees of freedom. There's the answer. Okay. Well, okay. Where, where does that come from? It's gonna be much good just to see an answer. So how, how do we get that? Let's let's look at them because I think I think this is is a good way to think about it and it'll help you review what you mean by interactions and the higher order interactions and things like that. So we said we had five main effects: A, B, C, D, and E. You know, those are the things we're varying: time, temperature, heat, whatever. Those are the five of them. So let's look at our first order interactions: A and B, A and C, A and D, A and E. That's, that's the first set. And I, I wrote them out like this so it's easy to see, you know. Uh, then B and C, B and D, B and E, and C and D, and C and E, and then D and E. And, and, and you know, very clearly in these things, the interactions, it's, it's not a permutation. A and B is the same as B and A. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why there is no B, A here, right? We've already counted it. So if we count all these first order, and remember they're first order because it's only one factor interacting with the other factor. I remember what those were. Those are the cases where, you know, maybe I change factor A down here and I get variation, and then I, I vary something else like B or C, and I get a different variation. 
that would be an interaction. You know, like, like I'm down here at one level of B and I get, you know, A. Uh, uh, when I change A, I get an increase in my output of 2. And I go over here to twice the level B and I get an increase in the output of 10 or something. There's an interaction clearly happening. Okay. So now let's look at the higher order ones. Okay, so we've got the first order interaction. Now let's look at the next level of interaction, right? Let's look at all these second order interactions. A, B, C, A, B, D, A, B, E. Okay, see how I made them out? B, C, D, B, C, E, B, D, E, A, C, D, A, C, A, D, E, and C, D, E. I think I got them all. And again, remember, it's not a, it's not a permutation, so C, B, A is the same as A, B, C. So I see I had 10 of the second orders, and you see, remember, second order has three things. And remember that little paper we had a discussion, it's almost, it's, at some point it gets kind of hard to, on some of these things to even explain what that is. You know, the interaction of time and, and temperature and, you know, uh, size or something may be explainable, but you know, some of them would get weird. Uh, third order are four terms interacting. A, B, C, D, A, C, D, E, B, C. You can see, it, it takes some, a little bit of thought even, making sure I don't miss, miss one or making sure I don't put one in twice or something like that. So there's five of these, and then the fourth order interaction, A, B, C, D, E. That's one of those. Okay, so that's our 5, 10, 10, 5, and 1. 31. Okay, so you see where they come from. That's where all these, these interactions came from. That's all the possible interactions we can think about in a three-factor experiment. Um, they each have these degrees of freedom because they had two levels. They each had one degree of freedom. So, so that was one way we got the 31 answer, the, what I call the hard way. Now, now, the simple way, uh, you could just use math, right? <laughs> right? We could say, hey, let's, let's recall our, our permutation and combination formulas. Remember those, they always show up all the time. We show them every, every time you study probability. And uh, so this is not a permutation, this is the combination. And remember, if you had uh, n things uh, with the R of them in the, in the combination, that's how many uh, possible combinations you had. And so uh, we can do that for the first order, second order, third order, fourth order, fifth order, and get those numbers that we got. You know, get the five and the 10 and the 10 mathematically without having to go through the tedium of listing them all and trying to put them in order. Let's see if that works. So you can know, hear the n factorial, r factorial, n minus r factorial, here it is. So very clearly for the main effects, we have five things to choose from, a, b, c, d, and e. We're gonna pick just one of them, a, b, c. So, we throw it in the formula, 5 factorial over 4 factorial is just plain 5. Well, that's right. We had A, B, C, D, or E. So hey, math works in this case. I, I like that. But I think I could have figured that out anyway. First order, we had five things to select from again, A, B, C, D, and E. But we're, we're combining two of them together, A and B, C and D, whatever. So just plug straight into the formula, 5, 2, 5, 2, you know, 10. Uh -huh. Third order, we have five things. We're combining three of them. Ten. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, good, all right. And then third order, five things four at a time. So we got five. And then finally the last one, the fifth order, uh, fourth order, I mean, five things five at a time, but one. Remember, zero factorial is one. We get that a lot of times. And, uh, and so, so we, we didn't have to go through the tedious process of laying out all the possible interactions. And why would I show you that? Well, what if you had eight things? <laughs> I, I don't know about you, I wouldn't do that. I, I could, but it would really annoy me. I probably would do it at least once. No, you know what I'll do? I'll do it once on four or five, make sure the formulas work, and then he plug into the formulas for eight. Uh, so, so that's the answer to seven one. So, so, so seven one is sort of an example seven one is sort of just, ah, let's get you, get your appetite wet in on, on what the interactions again are review that. Now let's let's jump into the and think about two factor two f. But let's jump let's jump into the essence of the chapter. Okay. So so one of the things we're going to do is uh, come up with some notation to help it look uh, succinct and to look at the tables uh, easily in the in, in the book. And I do the same thing in Excel. I use their same notation. So 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 it, let's look at this simple notation. We've got two factors a and b. And uh, A and B each have two levels because we're working the 2F example. We'll get to the 3F in a minute. So we're going to indicate the low level is zero, the high level is one. So, you know, it's low level is just two levels. You know, it might be a, a temperature of 30 degrees and 70 degrees centigrade, or it might be, you know, 
weight of 10 kilograms and 20 kilograms, something like that. It's the two levels. And in general, if it's a, if it's a process or something you're looking at, it's, it's the two extremes, you know, the low extreme and the high extreme, most likely. Uh, that would seem to make sense. Maybe, maybe you don't want to quite push it to the limit, but, but I, I probably would do that, especially if it's, you know, if it's analysis. Uh, so it's a, we have two factors, so F is two, we have two levels, so it's a 2F. So we have four treatments. Yeah, very simply, they're, they're A at low, combined with each of the Bs, and A at high, combined with each of the Bs. So one of the ways they're going to notate that is, you know, A0, B0, A1, B0, A0, B1, A1, B1. Or they might notate it this way. There's a couple of different ways they, they, they put the notation in the book. This seems to be the most common, although you'll still see the 001001 type stuff too. Uh, so simply notation, that's all this is. Now let's, let's look at this uh, in, in pictorially too, because I think this is kind of a nice way to think about it. So, so here I am with my, my graph, right? My response graph or whatever. Uh, well, this wouldn't be my response. This would be my... Uh, uh, factors, my selection. So, so pictorially, right, I'm down here at the low value of A and I have two values of B. I'm at the high value of A and I have two values of B. So if we were using this notation, you know, this experiment would be experiment one, the baseline, both of them at, at low level. Uh, this would be experiment A because I put A at the high level only. This would be experiment B because I put B at the high level and then this would be experiment A, B. So if we're talking about a response from this experiment, we could call it the response little tiny b. And so they're, what, what they're going to use this notation for is to derive some formulas for, for the 2F and 3F responses and results. And uh, they're going to denote the response here and here and here with these, these type of letters. So what you're saying is, OK, if I see response parentheses 1, that means the response at, with both factors set at their lowest level. If I see response A, B, that means the, 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 the signal or the measurement or the experimental result at both of them at their high levels. And then if we had C, just add a little C, et cetera, D, a little D, and, and we can go on. In fact, we will in a minute when we get to, like in the next two, two little lines. Yeah. Well, if we had three factors, A, B, and C. So it's a two, again, because we're doing high and low only, three factors. So we've got eight treatments, right? We had the first four that we just had, one, A, B, and A, B, and now we've got, so one, A, B, and A, B, those are the ones we had when we just had two factors. Now we added a third factor, C, A, C, B, C, and A, B, C, right? So we had C all by itself, A and C together, and then the higher order, second order interaction. And, and it, if you a couple of ways to think about that. We can look at the picture, or we can just be real simple and say, hey, when I added factor C, all I did was add C times any of these, right? Yeah, because I've got each of those still exists, and, and then I need to uh, combine them with C. So if you just multiply this by C, you get this. So it's an easy way to think about it. Now, pictorially, let's think about it. Remember before, we just had this front plane. Both of them low, A high, B high, A and B high. Well, now we just added C into the mix. So I just, I just moved, I just moved this plane that way, right? And instead of C being one, like it is down here, and you don't see it because it doesn't exist, now C is equal to little C up here in this back plane. So I get C, B, C, A, B, C, and A, C. So pictorially, that's, that's my experiment again. Remember, this is the experimental world, if you will. You know, it's the A, low high, B, low high, C, low high, all three of them high here. That's, that's what that picture's described. And then we could keep going with this discussion, right? We could add factor D and factor E, and we could keep making these. And, and we'll actually do that in one example. But So this is just notation again. You have, we haven't done any math yet. We haven't done any experiments. We haven't gotten any data yet. We will really again. Let's see. So, so now let's do a little math with it. So let's, let's, let's go back to the two-factor one. A and B only. Why? Because that's the simplest one to do math on, simplest one to consider, simplest one to, to analyze. And so let's let's look at what how we would calculate what the effect of A is, or what the effect of B is, or what an interaction is. So so perhaps 
if I were doing this and didn't have anybody to guide me, and I wanted to know what, what's the effect of A, well, well, wh why don't I just figure out uh, what it is at, at, at the low point uh, of B <coughs> and at the high point of B, because those are, I've got two factors, right? That's all I got, A and B, don't, don't think about C. So I could, I could vary A when B is down at its low point, and I could vary A when B is up at its high point, just average those two and call that my effect of A, right? So, so, so the effect of A would be the average of A at the low and high B. At, at low B, uh, it's just the A experiment minus the, the one where they're both low. Uh, but when B is turned up to its high level, 70 degrees C or whatever, it's uh, AB minus B. So I'm going to add those two and average them. Oh, okay, I'm going to call that. That's going to be my measured effect of A. And you'll see this, this ties back to the you know that it all works. It's not just something out of the sky. So, so let me just do the math on that. I'm just rearranging. What, what am I doing? I'm just rearranging to put them in the, in the order of, you know, uh, the experimental complexity, right? Nothing, uh, changing A, changing B, change, changing AB. And I got the little half out here. And we'll get rid of the half in a minute. Don't worry about it. Uh, so uh, let's see. What are the characteristics of this? Okay, notice that they're all there, right? One is A is there, B is there, A B is there right now. Some alternating signs. Okay, this is this is looking interesting, isn't it? Uh, well, let's look at the effect of B. What do you think we're going to do on B? Same thing. Let's average the effect of B at the low A and the high A. If I didn't know anything else, that's exactly what I would do. So down here at low A, my my B effect is the experiment at B value minus the experiment with them both at low, or it's the experiment at A B minus A. See the difference, right? Uh, a was analyzed at high B, and B was analyzed at high A. B is analyzed at low both, A is analyzed at low. Let's put them in order. Okay, now let's see what we got. Got them all again. Okay, and a minus. There's a difference, there's a difference, there's a similarity. Okay, right. so let's, let's do one more step. Let's, let's kind of analyze the interaction. So we could have, you know, what do we think an interaction is? Let's see, it's the difference in the effect of one factor at a different level of another. Right? So I said, didn't I? Yeah, I said that before, right? If I had, uh, what does A look like at low B? What does A look like at high B? What's the difference in that? If there's no difference, there's no interaction. But if there's a difference, there's an interaction. Let's form that difference. Let's form that difference. Okay, so let's see. The effect of A at high B was this. Remember, the effect of B at high A was minus A here. The effect of A at low B was that. Remember that? Okay, so the difference is just subtract those two. Right. And let's, uh, let's do an average again. Let's just cut that difference in half because the difference would be zero if they were both at low B or they were both at high B. Let's cut it in half. And let's write this thing in order again. Oh, let's see, we got the same thing. All of them are here. Again, we've got different signs. Remember, this was always minus and the others. Here's a plus, minus, minus, plus. Now, this is equation three. You can't see it. The other one was equation one and two and three. You can see it on the notes, but I guess I, I got them shrunk down here just a little bit. Let's see, let's make it wider. You can see it. There's equation three. That's equation two, and that's equation one. Okay, now, let's see. Now, Let's put these coefficients on the 1, the A, the B, and the AB. Let's put them in. Yeah. This was the equation 1. Remember it had minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1 relative to those coefficients. This is the B. Remember you had the switch in there? Minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. And here's the AB. That's an interesting table. Very interesting. Look at, look at the AB column. I didn't even have to make it up, right? Isn't AB just a product of these? Yeah, it is. That's pretty cool. All right. And this 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 table uh, reminds me of, of unit vectors. Uh, and, and it also reminds me of something else we had earlier in class. We'll, we'll, do, we'll talk about it here. Remember, remember old Sheffy and his little method back in page 30 where we were worried about we ran the ANOVA 
and we saw that there was an effect, but we had three factors or two factors. We didn't know which one. It just said, yeah, there's something that's an effect. We used Sheffy's method to, to pick out um, which one mattered, and we had those things called contrasts, and maybe they were a sum of all the means, or maybe it was three times one mean minus the other, something like that. I think these things look like that. Okay, and, and so we had, the, this is something that's similar we've seen before, and uh, uh, it's also, remember from Sheffy's thing that the sum of these was always zero, right? Remember when we had, if we had plus three on one mean, we had to have minus one, minus one, minus one. Those, those were always zero, yeah, that's nice. That's nice. And um, so, so that's one of the properties, <laughs> properties for contrast. Uh, and in these cases, look at this. Um, all of these, if you took the product of one column with another and added them up, you get a big fat zero, don't you? Let's see. Plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. Oh, that's a zero. Minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one. That's a zero. Yeah, yeah. So they're called uh, orthogonal, if that's true. So orthogonality is something that's you know, always important to us. Now, you, you, you remember back on go, hopefully you had some type of class, when you had a, yeah, we had a, we associated unit vectors in each of these directions. Right? Remember X had an I unit vector, Y had a J unit vector. And we had this concept of orthogonality because this is, you know, an orthogonal yeah. coordinate axis. And we had, you know, here we had, you know, I dot product with J equals zero. J dot product with K equals zero. And I dot K was also zero. Well, doesn't that look very similar to something we just put on the board? Yeah. The product of each of those columns is zero. In fact, that is a dot product, right? Remember when you had multiple vectors, you did the I dot I, and, you know, you, you did all that stuff. And, and if we had functions, like if I had a, uh, you know, I had a really boring function that was only in the xy plane and was parallel to the y axis, well, this this would be one dimensional, wouldn't it? It would be only a function of y. We don't care what x is and c is if it's in that plane. And if I had a function over here, like a line or a squiggly line that was only in the in the zy plane, well, this would be two dimensional, right? It would be a function of y. Z, and then maybe I have some goofy function that you know comes out here, and, you know, is, is, is up up in the z. I shouldn't make all draw lines either z, but it's up in the z and over in the x and the y. This is a three D function, function of x, y, and z. So, so if I have some sort of fitting routine, some sort of least squares thing, or some sort of fitting routine, I could fit each of these functions to 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 uh, you know to to some you know f of x. I world plus f of y and the j world. It might be more complex than that even. It could be. But 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 nonetheless, um, maybe I should write it this way so I don't make you think it has to be a function of x. Just I'll fit some I'll fit something to it. Okay. Um, and, and if I fit this one, then we know that that one would be gone and that one would be gone. Right? And if I fit this line, we would know that we would have that one and that one, but we wouldn't have that one. And if I fit this squiggly thing, I'd have all three. Well, gee, if, if I have this thing uh, in my mind, this picture in my mind, but, but if I can, in my mind, go over to a mathematical world, that's great. Unless it's going to a mathematical world. Now, instead of x, y, and z on my axis, why don't I put factor A, factor B, and factor C? <laughs> we just did that. We just did that graph a minute ago. And I got some function, whatever it is, and I fit it with an ANOVA, and I find out, or I fit it with these contrasts. Wouldn't it be nice to use some sort of unit vectors like these contrasts? A unit vector, the B unit vector, even the AB if we want to. I, I, I don't want to try to draw that. Or the C unit vector. And if we fit this and we come up with a you know with an A in the 
A direction, I'll call some unit vector, that's the contrast, B in the B direction and C in the C direction. And, and if I fit this, and my fit is an ANOVA or some sort of mathematics of these contrasts, and I don't get this and I don't get that, well, that tells me only factor A matters. Or if I get these two and I don't get that, that says A and B matter. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing with this ANOVA. That's what we're doing with these mathematics. Never mind, you know, in, in, in the geometrical world, I drew it X, Y, Z, and we can see it in 3D space. I drew it here like this, but, I, you know, it doesn't look like that. It's a mathematical thing. But, you know, that's what a 4A series is too, right? I'm, I'm, I'm fitting a sine with, with some coefficient, and I'm fitting a cosine with some coefficient. These things are orthogonal, you know, if you give them the right characteristics. So, so I fit them in a mathematical space with orthogonal function. Eigenvectors are the same thing with operations world. They're, they're splitting it up into, into orthogonal components. This, these are orthogonal, I'm saying, hey, these are easy to see because we live in this world. These are orthogonal too. So, so if, if we can break it up into these orthogonal mathematical components, if you will, do our fit, which is, you know, like our dot product or whatever, and we come up, like I said, with only A or only B, we, we've, we've, we've said, oh, I've got a planar function. Right? Or I've got a linear function. B didn't matter. C didn't matter. Now, but you're going to say, well, 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 Reed, you know, when I fit this with that ANOVA, I get these goofy P values. You know, sometimes they're 0.01, sometimes they're 0.015. Yeah, that's because our functions that we're trying to fit aren't clean and smooth like this, right? They're bumpy. They're lumpy. So they got, you know, they got a little bit of A or a little bit of B. That's why P is 0.04. Or, or 0.07. So maybe it's got a lot. Maybe it's 0.8. It's got a lot of A or none. You know, or you know, maybe it's really bad. But that's why we don't come out with super clean things. We have to use these P's to say, well, yeah, it's mostly in the A direction, or mostly in the B, and mostly not in the C, or those kind of things. P is low, or or F, yeah, whichever you're looking at. So, so that's that's what this is doing. It's just kind of neat. You know, we've got these vectors, if you will, in our space. And we've created these very uh, interesting vectors that we can use to explore our space and ask ourselves, is there, is there a function in there? Is, is there something going on? And we're asking it mathematically. So now, now that we've had that, that, that divergence there, uh, uh, let's see. So let's go back to our average effects, our <laughs> contrasts, our equations one, two, three. Let's see, we got rid of the half uh, when we made the contrast table. And the book throws out two formulas, which, which I'm not going to drive for you. I'm just going to say they're interesting and we'll use them. Um, the, the average effect is uh, the ith contrast uh, divided by this, okay, good morning. where the contrast is at 1 minus A minus B plus AB effect, those kind of things. So if you, we, we, are, we did derive that one. We, we just explained it you know, when we did it. Then there's the ith sum of the square error is the ith contrast squared divided by this. That's not obvious, okay? <laughs> so so I'll, I'll throw it out this way. I'll say, hey, the first one was, was obvious. We did it, we derived it, uh, we came up with it. This last one's not so obvious. They don't drive it either. I probably owe you a, a paper to find the derivation. Uh, but, but we'll use this in example seven too. So at least you'll, 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 you're, you're comfortable with that. It's kind of like I know we use it, but we don't always derive them. And we'll use both of these equations and you'll, you'll understand them better. Okay, so let's see. So now, if you have more factors, you can, you can continue this thing, right? We, we can come up with a C factor and, and have factor C at all the high levels, minus, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, le uh, factor I at the high level of C, I at the high, low level of C, those kind of things. And then the interactions we could, we saw, we could make from the product of the basic contrast. So, so we don't even have to go through that that mathematics we did uh, for the A-B interaction, we could just form the product of the two vectors. And we'll, we'll do that in our example 7-4. Let's see. So let's see. So let's see. So let's, here, mathematically, I'll create table 7-3 for you just so you'll see it. So let's see. Table 7-3 is, is uh, page, yeah, page 147. So we, we've got three factors. I'll just look at the first couple. So remember we had the, the main effect of A was uh, A at all the high levels, right? A uh, with itself 
and then uh, B is high, C is high, both of them high, minus all the lows. C is low. The main effect of B is that one. C minus that one. So now we can form our um, our table. C. So here would be A. C. Start over here. Yeah, plus one, plus one, minus minus. I'm just taking the coefficients off of it. Same with B. Plus one, minus minus here. So I'm taking the coefficients off of that. A B. We can take from the product of this. C we had over here, minus all of those, plus all of those. We keep going. We could do AC, BC, ABC just by forming these products. And if you look at C, that's what they did in the table. You look at C, once you got to C, now you can form BC, which is just column B times C, and ABC, which is the product of all three of them. Or the product of AB and C, if you want to do it that way, it's similar to look at. That could be an easy way to do it too. So now, now with this table, we've got these, these, these contrasts. We can also use those formulas to do our ANOVA without doing ANOVA. Uh, we can do it with those two formulas we just introduced. So let's see. Let's try it. Let's try it with example 7.3. Oh, well, oh, sorry. 7.3 has got a discussion first. Then we can do it. So, so 7.3 um, is... It's an obvious example, but, it, but, but it's okay. Well, they put it in there. What, what they did with example 7.3, they said, uh, let's look at the three, I guess it relates to the design experiments, let's look at the three possibilities we might have uh, with these with four factors, A, B, C, and D. So um, one, one experiment you could have um, is just two, fact, two, two levels of, uh, on each of them. You have four factors and you had two levels on each of them. So you had uh, one degree of freedom on everything. Let's see, we got all the, we got the, the, the main effects, A, B, C, and D, and the first order effects, uh, A, B, A, C, et cetera. And then we put all the second higher order interactions into the error term. Uh, we look up at all our degrees of freedom. We wind up with the, uh, five total in the error. And we have a total of 16 tests, two to the fourth. And then they said, well, consider the possibility that you had now this is where we get the mix and match, where you might have three levels on A and two levels on B, C, and D. So now we would have three times eight uh, tests, 24 total, and you can look how the degrees of freedom changed. The only ones that changed, of course, are the ones that, excuse, excuse me, that interact with A. You know, they all went up one, because A, A, A got, had two degrees of freedom now instead of, instead of one, because there was three levels of A. And then the third experiment was put three levels of A and B and two levels of C and D and see what you get. So the, the whole point of this, why, why do they do this? What they're trying to get you to think about is if I was doing a screening test and I had four factors, A, B, and C, and D, which one of these would I like to choose? Uh, or what are the advantages and disadvantages of choosing one or the other? Well, well clearly the first trade-off is that the, the simplest one with two levels each had 16 uh, experiments. The next one had 24 and the last one had 36. So it's going to take you more resources, time, money, experiments to do the ones with more levels. Okay, that might be one of your guiding factors right there. And remember the, the basis of this chapter was we got all of these tests done under the same background conditions. So if these are long experiments, maybe going from 20 or 16 to 36 puts you over the threshold. You'd have to do it on separate, under separate conditions and you couldn't, you couldn't maintain the, the basic assumption that these are all got the same background. And so then, oh, okay, we have to go to chapter eight techniques. Uh, but uh, you also notice the error terms. As you, as you go up in the number of experiments, we've increased our uh, additional degrees of freedom. We have more uh, degrees of freedom in our error, which is gonna give us a better, uh, you know, F stat and a better, you know, a better MS. Uh, and so we're gonna get a better estimation of the error and so our tests will be more sensitive. So, so there's value going that way. So, you know, they're just trying to get you to think about the design of experiment aspects and trading off between two levels versus three. And why would you do this? Well, because maybe A and B are, are 
are super sensitive and it's just not going to do to go from low to high. You kind of need one in the middle because, because it's super sensitive there. Or you think it is. You know, at this point, you haven't done the test, you really don't know. So that was the, that's the point of that example. Uh, yeah, we'll go back. We'll go back to example two. We'll discuss it. I know. I, I guess it probably makes sense to discuss it now before I get into the three. So let's let's do example seven two uh, on the XL because I've got to pass it up. All right. So example seven two. What they did in example seven two is they they. What, what they've done in example 7-2 is they've come up with a, a hy hypothetical two-factor experiment, A and B. And they don't, you know, unlike some of the examples they give, you know, where they get some scenario, they just give you some data. So, uh, so they originally introduced this hypothetical two-factor experiment early in the chapter on, on page 41. And, uh, uh, yeah, the orange data is this. It doesn't look very orange on here, does it? The green data. <laughs> it's, it's orange in, in, the, in, the, in the Excel spreadsheet. But the green data is the original data they introduced uh, on page 141, and they, then they said, okay, now let's extend this experiment and let's do two replications. So what you're looking at, uh, these are uh, A low, uh, this. This is the 1-1, one, one, right? This is A and B both low. This is a uh, uh, a uh, B low and A high. This is B high and A low, and B high and A high. So this is the first set. Uh, both low, A only high, B only high, both of them high. Then this is the second set. Both low, A high, B low, A and B high. So that's, how, that's how it's arranged. So, so we want to know: is there an A B effect? Is there an interaction, etc.? So this. This is, uh, we've already done this, right? This is a two-factor ANOVA with two replications. A two-factor with replications, so we can do that. We, we can do it just like we did before. Uh, select it, uh, do the two-factor, let it spit out the ANOVA. Okay, here we go. And uh, let's see. Uh, this one was A, this one was B, this is AB. So let's see, our conclusion was, boy, A really mattered, uh, B didn't matter, and there wasn't any interaction. And, and remember, uh, on page 145, they've got the graph. And, and, and if you don't like doing ANOVAs, you know, you just always do the graph. The graph, you look at it, and the graph says, oh, yeah, I can see A mattered, B didn't, and there wasn't much of an interaction. I can, I can see that from the graph without having to do an ANOVA, unless, it start, you know, unless the graph gets close or things get tied. Or I'm, I'm, so, so this is our answer. We can be done here uh, with our old chapter stuff. Uh, from chapter, uh, I guess, three, right? But we can also do it uh, by hand using these contrasts and, and doing the uh, uh, mathematics that we had from those two equations that they threw out without proof. And so we might want to do this, not in this particular case, because this particular case is easy, but we might want to do it in the case of example 7 4 where we can pull out this quadratic effect or other effects. So, so let's look at the mathematics here. Uh, just to see. So um, here were those signs, right? Uh, minus, plus, minus, plus. Uh, that was for the A, that was for the B, that was for the AB. Remember, that's the product of those. Here's the data. I just stuck it in again. Same data from the other page. Uh, A low, uh, B low, A only high, B only high, both high, and then the, rep the two replications. Two replications. Let's see. What am I doing? Uh, okay. Let's get. Oh, and how do you handle replications? Just, let's just add them, right? So both one tests, uh, are, where they're both uh, uh, both low, are these two, right? These are the two replications of both of them low, 15 and 12. These are the two replications of A high. These are the two replications of B high, and these are the two replications of both of them. I tried to do the colors so you could see. Who went with what? And then um, uh, let's do these contrasts. Show you how to do that. Remember the contrast take these values, but apply those signs. And remember I, the notation was the one in parentheses. It was take take the take the 
source, the experimental measurement at that point, not a one and not an A. And the little A was say, take the experimental value at that point. So, so this is the experimental value of one, just some of those two. This is the experimental value with A high. This is the experimental value with B high. This experimental value with both of them high. In fact, you can look at it right there. You can see that B is not doing anything. Right? You can see A is the main culprit. Okay, anyway, so how do we do this, this contrast? Minus times that, plus times that, minus times that, plus times that. That was the first contrast. How we do the second? Minus times that, minus times that, plus times that, plus times that. So that's where these come from. Again, I tried to color coordinate them. So you look at it, so well, you got the same numbers. Yeah, I did, but the signs are different. Okay. So those are those contrasts. So the A contrast was 46, the B was minus 6, A, B was 4. Uh, let's see. Uh, we can see, we got, uh, so how do we get the sum of the squares? If we can focus it, it's the contrast squared uh, divided by the number of replications uh, and times the sum of this uh, CIJ squared. So let's see. This one, we can look at it. It's there. So I got the sum of that. Let's see, it was four. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, it's always that way. That's right. Regardless. Yeah. One plus one plus one plus one. We square each one of them. All right, so the sum of the squares at A, okay, would be, for example, D17, <coughs> the A contrast. Square. In fact, here I'll try to do it this way. It'll be easier to see. You can see the mathematics is pretty simple. So, sum of the squares at A using this formula is the the contrast of A squared divided by the number of replications divided by that, uh, which is it was the same for all of them. Okay, so that's where that comes from. Sum of the square B. Well, we're just going to move over one. It's that squared divided by that and that, and sum of the square. <laughs> A, B, well, yeah, it's just that one squared divided by that and that. And then the sum of the squared total okay, is the sum of uh, R20 to R23. What is that? Let's see. Oh, yeah, it's all of them uh, added up. Let's see. Yeah, R, no, let's see, R20 to R23. And yeah, let's see, that's those three. Yep, okay. And where did... Now that's not, let's see. There it is, here it is. Yes, thank you. R20 to S. It shouldn't have been those. It should be these. Yeah. These and these, these are the uh, each each one squared minus its grand mean. Okay. Alright, so if I took uh, the grand mean, which is just the, the mean of the whole thing, and then if I take each one minus the grand mean and square. Yeah. So here at the grand mean, uh, the grand mean, let's see, here's the grand mean, should have been the average of everybody in this table. Yeah, okay, so, so now, if I take the SST, the SSA, the SSB, the SSA, so I can get the SS sum of the square error, which we recall from long ago, the sum of the square error was the total minus A minus B minus AB, uh, became 13, all right, so now, I can just build the table, right, I got my, um, here we got this. Say, for example, would be. <coughs> I can't see it. I've got not enough space there. Let's see. All right, so now let's get him. All right. Uh, well, I just wrote the answer in. What did I do? Okay, yeah, so, oh, these are my degrees of freedom, yeah, okay. So what I'm doing, yeah, no, I'm sorry, here, this is what we were looking for. Uh, I just wanted to show you that it was the same as the, uh, the ANOVA. So look, two, 264, 5, 4 and a half, and 2, you know, the ANOVA, 264, 5, 4 and a half, 2, sum square total was 13. Degrees of freedom, we can just calculate, that's all I was doing there. So we could build, uh, you know, I didn't finish it, I didn't do an F, F calculation, 
think it, yeah, I didn't do the F. But 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 the point is, I I could I could come up with the same information that's in the ANOVA, um, building these this table um, using this equation from that they didn't derive but that they proved. So so it's another another way to do what the ANOVA is doing, which is to do this uh, orthogonal concept and asking yourself, does A matter? Does B matter? Does A times B matter? And we could do it uh, differently, which we may do that in the future. So let's see. So, so that was that's that's where all of the stuff in example seven two comes from. So you got an idea of what what's made up in that. It's, it's pretty complex to think about it. Now, if we go to the three F, so that was a two F. Why? Because we had two left, low and high. So now we might want to go to three left, three F, low, medium, and high. And so let's look at a simple example. We've got two factors, three levels, one observation at each one. So if we had two factors, A, uh, we'd have two degrees of freedom. B, we'd have two degrees of freedom. Uh, the error term, we'd have the product of A and B, we'd have four degrees of freedom. Uh, so we'd have a pretty small error term. You say, ah, well, I, I, probably, don't, uh, I probably don't want to do that, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have more levels in a minute. So let's see, and more factors. Uh, and, and then this is how it lays out in, the, um, in this experiment world, right? We've got low of A, uh, middle of B, high B, so now we've got 0, 1, and 2 instead of just 0, 1. Uh, middle of A, and then low, medium, and high B. And then high A, low, medium, and high B. So there's our notation again. And I made the comment early on, if it's a, if it's a quantitative um, experiment, we're measuring something, it's not a qualitative yes, no type thing. And if these levels are equally spaced, 3, 5, and 7, or you know, 10, 20, and 30, that kind of thing, then we could not only do a linear calculation, but we could also do a quadratic one. And the way they do that is they come up with the appropriate contrast. Uh, in fact, they show you that quadratic contrast on page 151, and I've got it in my example 7.4. So that'll be our, our final example here. So, so, so what, what they do on the quadratic example um, and the linear example for the three level, you can see, makes a little sense, uh, especially if you trying to find a difference. Remember, let's see, so for the linear, for the linear contrast, that's equation, that's equation 7.8, and they'll take an experiment at the, uh, uh, two level, and they'll subtract the experiment at the zero. So that's the linear. And that makes sense, right? This is high, and this is low. Or they've got an equation 7 and 9. Drive each one by subtracting the uh, adding the high and the low, or subtracting the high and the low for the quadratic. And if you I wish I did that one. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at these two, if you've done any finite differences, you know that looks just like the second the derivative in there. And when you do it with, with the finite differences, so that's what they're doing. Okay, so this is these are the contrast equations. Now let's let's apply this to a real situation. But we got more, you know, we got more than one variable we might have. Like they've got the little dot in there to indicate, well, you might have A or B or C. So let's, let's do an example so we'll understand it, because otherwise it seems strange. So, so their example is example 7 4. And in this case, they did, they did come up with a, you know, a, 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 a scenario. They said you've got steel bars, uh, or metal bars, yeah, steel rods, and we're heating them. Uh, heating at three different temperatures, a low and a moderate and a high temperature, and we're doing it three different times of the day. And our question is, does, does the length of the rod have anything to do with the, how much heat we apply to them 
and does it have anything to do with the time of day? So uh, they don't tell you much about you know the, the, the environment, but in some it's the time of day it's in the lab it doesn't matter. You know, air conditioning's on in the morning, the evening. So so you would think that the, you know if we're just heating steel rods and looking at their length, time of day doesn't matter, <laughs> the phase of the moon doesn't matter, but but the heat will, right? It should get longer since uh, it's still you know, still expands. So here's some data. They got three different times, three different heats, two replications at each point in time. So we can come up with a good error term as well. Remember that. Uh, these are uh, assuming that the, these are equally spaced here. And these are these are equally spaced, so we could uh, have that quadratic uh, calculation. So again, uh, we've done this before, right? This this is uh, this is my little notes over here. I'll tell you a two-factor with replication ANOVA. So, so we don't have to, you know, we don't have to do this with <coughs> contrast. We can still use our ANOVA, select this blob, say two-factor with two replications per experiment, run the ANOVA, guess that just spits it out right there, okay, and we can ask ourselves what matters. Uh, this row is time, this row is heat, and this row is the interaction of heat and time. So looking at our P values, right, time, time of day didn't matter, you know, little f compared to f critical. Uh, uh, heat really mattered, teeny tiny P, or a, a huge f compared to f critical, and then there wasn't an interaction term. Exactly what we thought. Okay, but again, um, could, could we perhaps expand on this table? Could we look, is there a quadratic effect with heat or something? Can we use what we learned in this chapter, generate this information, and expand on it? Well, the answer is yeah, we could. And we may do that in the future, too. So let's see. So let's see. Here's the same data. Low heat, moderate heat, high heat. Uh, right, now let's see. Let's look at our contrast. Let's see. I've got, I've summed up both replications down here, like we did in the last example, so that I can have my experimental result for multiple replications. There's two replications, so we've got that in there. Here's the grand mean, which is just the average of everything in that table. And then here's our sum of the square, which would be, you know, each of those, yeah, the, the, each thing minus the grand mean. You can see it there, let's see. Yeah, each of these things minus the grand mean squared. Uh, then let's look at these contrasts, because that's, that's the thing you had to set up. So the linear one, 